that she is an amazing psychiatrist. I've just been on her page and uh, she's been on, you know, uh, mainstream media. Welcome, Carol. And uh, I would want you to just give a brief, uh, you know, introduction to my viewers. So that would be great. Okay. Well, thank you. It's good to be here. Um, yes, I am a psychiatrist. I'm called America's psychiatrist. Um, I was born and bred in New York City. And then now currently I live in Los Angeles and have a practice in Beverly Hills. And um, I do a lot of different things as a psychiatrist. That was my plan, actually, when I decided to become a psychiatrist. Wasn't just to see patients in my office, you know, 24-7, but to be able to spread information to other people who... Mm -hmm. you know, who can't come in to, to get treatment. And so I do that by writing books and doing television appearances. And I have two radio shows and, um, and speaking engagements and so on. And I also do, um, I'm a forensic psychiatrist, an expert witness, meaning that um, I testify in cases, you know, civil cases, criminal cases, um, mm -hmm. about the psychological issues that there are. So okay. it's a number of different things um, that we're going to be discussing about some mental health issues. And uh, people, you know, what happens, they don't dare to accept this fact and ignore it. And, uh, you know, they just do not bring it up that they really, you know, having some problems and some issues where you would say that, like, you know, uh, schizophrenia and major depressive disorder, bipolar disorder, some post-traumatic disorder. So if, you know, you would be noticing a lot more different people, different patients that be coming to you. So what other problems do you see normally these days that, you know, patient, they, patients, they come up with some mental disorder that you just like to talk about. And then from further, we're just going to give it a gift start and we will further, you know, continue with asking you some more questions. Well, um, I treat patients with all different kinds of problems, like the ones that you mentioned. Um, also sort of a garden variety type anxiety and depression. You know, not necessarily major depression, but more uh, something that's called dysthymia, which is a low grade depression. Um, you know, t the thing is that the way the world, at least at least in America, um, the wor things have gotten. Uh, there are well, certainly all over the world with you know COVID and you know things that are happening mm -hmm. all over. Um, really, people are feeling much more uh, having more problems in general. And because COVID made everyone feel, uh, get more in touch with their mortality. In other words, to there was death all around. And you heard in the media all the time, you know, when they were giving statistics, how many people died today of COVID yeah. and so on. And that has left a general sense of um, people feeling like they, wondering how much longer they have to live, you know, wondering about, not just about COVID, because hopefully that is uh, lessening, all mm -hmm. over, but, um, but, you know, it, it made people more aware of all kinds of dangers. Mm -hmm. And um, besides causing anxiety and depression, that has caused some people to act like, um, like they have nothing left to lose, you know, mm -hmm. like if you give in to their impulses, because, um, well, I'm not going to be around for long, much longer anyway, so I might as well just do what I want. That's an attitude that uh, unfortunately a lot of people have gotten. So for example, the um, the air rage that we see, you know, people acting crazy on airplanes. We never used to have that before. Uh, mm -hmm. Also a big problem is that during the time of, of COVID lockdowns, people were home more and they spent much more time than they used to uh, online and particularly playing violent video games. And it has been known for, known for decades that um, the more violent media, uh, television, movies, certainly especially video games that a person consumes, the more aggressive they become. Yeah. So that's why um, we're seeing, at least in the States, we're seeing more mass shootings, school shootings, supermarket shootings, you know, because people have been basically in training during the lockdowns, mm -hmm. watching all these videos, because they use videos like that to train the military 
to get the military desensitized to the idea of killing somebody. And so if you play, you know, countless hours of, of violent video games where you're shooting people, people are dying, you know, and sure. pretend anyway, mm -hmm. it's very easy to then come out and, and be trained to do it in real life. Right. Okay. So in America, because, you know, that's another different part of the world. What sort of patients mostly do you see that, yeah, there is this major problem that people, they are, or patients, they are suffering with? So what do you notice these days and uh, to your part of the world? One of the things that I notice is um, teenagers are um, are having a lot harder time than, than they used to um, because of the school's uh, having been closed during COVID. Mm -hmm. And so they were, they were not seeing their friends. And I mean, of course, they also weren't getting an education. I mean, they were, they were learning online, you know, by Zoom, but um, they weren't having the socialization experiences of being with mm -hmm. their friends. And so a lot of teenagers have gotten very depressed. Plus, um, they, they don't, you know, when you're, when you're growing up, um even in high school well, all the years of school um including of course being a teenager you're you're you know people always ask you what do you want to be when you grow up mm -hmm. and um there's a general sense that we don't know if how the world is going to be you know um so so kids uh don't really have that sense of of um aiming for something of working towards something you know of, of mm -hmm. planning on what they're going to study or looking forward to uh getting married and having children and you know the things that one normally does when one grows up yeah. mm -hmm. so it's there it's kind of like it's a blank you know it's well how is the world going to be when i grow up sure. um so they're really there's um they're depressed they're suicidal they're anxious um and and it's and it's understandable you know it's hard to say <laughs> it's hard to say that that's i mean yes of course depression is a psychiatric disorder but it's hard to say when you know they're they're correct in a sense like when you look at some of the things happening all over the world like um cancel culture and mm -hmm. um you know the, the i don't know how much this is in south africa but like woke wokeness you know people um uh saying that certain things are good and other things are bad or um it, it's it's just very uh very discouraging and so yeah. when you when a, so, so when the, the point is sorry like you know the point is that uh, teenagers they are completely distracted like from their normal routine they used to be of course like you know completely completely out of their track and they they didn't find the way like you know what's when you know they would just you know go in you can say you know they would just you know turn up into their 30s and uh 40s so how would be the world like so of course yeah right. uh, that's completely understandable now let us discuss about with the first uh, you know mental illness which i would want you to just shed some light and that's a schizophrenia and uh what do you think that what could be the causes and the common sim symptoms and the traits of uh you know schizophrenia and of course like you know uh if suppose you're going to talk about the prevention or the treatment so what could that be so let us begin with this also okay um well, schizophrenia is what's called a thought disorder mm -hmm. as compared to manic depressive illness, which is also called bipolar, which is considered a mood disorder. Mm -hmm. So in schizophrenia, you have problems of thinking. You have um, you have uh, also problems of perceptions, like you typically hear voices um, and see things. And so... Um, you know, you might hear sometimes people hear voices that tell them to do things. So those mm -hmm. are called command hallucinations. And um, and then um, people with schizophrenia are um, shy or are, are don't want to get into go, they don't feel comfortable being with other people in the world. Um, 
So they're, they oftentimes are, are loners. Um, what else? Um, sometimes they have delusions, meaning that um, they have certain thoughts that are not really the way uh, life is. And, you know, it's, it's um, not reality, but they have a firm, fixed belief um, you can't convince them that you know that they can they can say um, uh, the world is filled with green little green people, and there's no way you could convince them that uh, it isn't filled with little green people. I mean, I'm not saying that all schizophrenics think the world is filled with little, but that's just an example of a delusion. Um, mm-hmm. And um, and it usually it it, it most often manifests itself when the person is between about 17 or 18 and 25 but you can also there is such a thing as childhood schizophrenia so some people do show the disorder uh have it begin in childhood and um so usually there's a first break you know there is some incident where uh usually it's a very dramatic incident where the person is having a psychotic um breakdown as, as they go into a um you know they something is happening oftentimes uh it's a frightening kind of thing that they're going through and uh, typically there might be um so people see that this person is is suddenly not themselves um it's important of course to go to a psychiatrist or a psychiatric emergency room when something like that happens there is treatment for schizophrenia there's treatment for all mental illnesses um mm-hmm. The treatment, there are a lot of different medications, but it's not just medication alone that helps for any disorder, schizophrenia, depression, any anxiety, anything that you want to mention, any kind Mm -hmm. of psychiatric disorder. The answer is not just medication. For those disorders where there is medication, you know, where medication can help, that's great, but um, you need psychotherapy along for whatever the disorder is. And that is the most important part because that gets to the root of it, even for schizophrenics. You know, what's so interesting with schizophrenics is that when they talk about their delusions or their hallucinations, that gives you an insight into what really was bothering them in their life. You know, you can, if you take the time to really understand what this delusion or hallucination is, it gives you an idea of what happened to them, how they were traumatized as a child. Now, uh, schizophrenia is a genetic disorder. You, okay. you're, you're genetically predisposed. You know, if you have parents or grandparents or somebody, an uncle, um, someone, you inherit the gene for it. But not everybody who inherits the gene, you know, from their family will become schizophrenic. It has to do with. Um, if you have had different traumas along the way that bring it out. And one of the biggest problems these days um, is people with a genetic predisposition to schizophrenia, but have no idea and no symptoms and so on, um, smoke weed, smoke pot. And all of a sudden the symptoms come out because um, we, we know that um, that makes a change in the brain that actually brings out uh, the 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 manifestation of schizophrenia. Okay, so what do you think that could be the causes, you know, uh, of uh, schizophrenia? You think so that yeah, it's a genetic problem, and do you also think that uh, you know it can be more worsened because of the environmental changes or because of some family pressure? Uh, how do you see it? How would you elaborate yes, it? Yes. Yes, you. Um, if someone is born with a genetic predisposition to schizophrenia, but they have a perfect life, <laughs> nobody has a perfect life. But um, you know, if they don't have any major traumas or um, or difficulties, um, it will unlike it's unlikely that it will that they'll start to show symptoms. So it's not like a you know um, like a sentence, uh, like I was going to say like a death sentence. It's not, you know, you don't die from schizophrenia, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> it's not a sentence to have this, um, disorder necessarily. It's just that obviously people who do have that background have family members with schizophrenia should try very hard to, uh, either to, first of all, to get therapy, even if they don't have any symptoms of schizophrenia and to try to have a, a sort of simplified life. 
Do you think that bipolar uh, disease and, and bipolar disorder disease and this is schizophrenia, they're the same or there is some, you know, you see that, you know, difference in both of the disease if you would like to elaborate on that. Sure. No, it's two different disorders. Um, schizophrenia, it was originally called manic depressive illness. Uh, you know, then they changed it to bipolar, but I still like manic depressive illness better because it explains what it is. Mm -hmm. It's um, going someone who goes through periods of mania, um, you know, hyper excited, uh, talking very fast, um, calling people in the middle of the night, going on sprees like shopping sprees or gambling sprees or uh, and doing you know, somebody with bipolar also uh, often does things that are, you know, unusual kinds of behavior. Um, but again, as I was saying earlier, it's a mood disorder uh, where schizophrenia is a thought disorder. So in bipolar, it's all about the moods. You go from periods where you're super excited, as I was starting to say, um, you know, and, and part of the problem is that when people are in a manic episode, mm -hmm. When they're in a hypomanic episode, meaning like a little less than than full mania, it's a very happy feeling. You know, it's a very you, you can get a lot done, or at least you think you're getting a lot done. Um, and so, so it's very hard to get someone when they're like that to agree to go to see a psychiatrist or go to a psychiatric hospital or take medication or get therapy because they think, you know, I'm king of the world. Um, an example of a person uh, who is in a hypomanic phase right now is um, Kanye West. I don't know how much, um, how much you've been hearing about that, but he's, you know, been going around saying all kinds of things and crazy kinds of things. Um, and and he has made you know it's see this is the thing there's hypomania um where you're a little high and then you typically go into a more a bigger you know a more uh, ex excited kind of um stage of mania where you're not really making sense schizophrenia you really don't make sense you have word salad it's called um in bipolar it's not word salad. Uh, it's it's looseness. It's I'm sorry. It's flight of ideas. So mm -hmm. you're talking really fast, and you're you know you're jumping from one topic to the other. You you can st other people can still follow it if they pay close attention. You're not talking about you know um, totally your sentences make sense, but they're not really related. Um, they're not they're they're flight of ideas. They're kind of like tangents going off on a tangent. So, um, and, and so, um, Kanye West, for example, has gone, um, the problem is that yes, you can feel happy for a while, but then you do things that really are very self-destructive. So like using Kanye as an example, um, he did things, said outrageous things and so on. And he got people really angry at him. People who were giving him contracts worth millions of dollars, um bill if you know hundreds of all kind of, very a lot of money and he he messed up his relationship with them because people didn't want to be associated with him when he was saying really uh outrageous kinds of things you know um uh bigoted kinds of things and um and so he lost lots of money um billions actually altogether you know he's so, so that's what people, that's when they're in a manic phase, this can happen. So it's a very serious, you know, uh, situation. Also de the depressive stages um, that people are, you know, get very depressed and um, they can be suicidal with major depression or with the depression of uh, bipolar. You can, you can be so depressed that you feel like killing yourself. So and so that's very dangerous also. So do you think that it has some stages or, you know, it's going to go worse, or it is just like, you know, from the beginning, it's just sort of a very worsening kind of situation or condition where patients, they can have, or you think so, no, no with time and age, you know, it getting worse and worse. So uh, well, what is the it, rate? It depends on, on whether they get treatment or not. Mm -hmm. um, see, it's easier really to live with bipolar illness than it is with schizophrenia, but both of them are like diabetes in the sense that they are chronic disorders, mm -hmm. but they both can be managed. 
um, with the right medicine and the right psychotherapy, they both can be managed and um, people can have, you know, successful lives as long as they're in treatment. Mm -hmm. But when, you know, as I was saying, when someone is in a manic phase or a hypomanic phase and they're thinking, I don't want to, you know, this feels good. I don't want to get treatment and, and uh, get better from this. This is great. So that's what makes it very uh, difficult. Okay, good, good, good. You just, you know, I think that uh, elaborated it so well. And I hope that, you know, it will be very amazing, insightful for my viewers to understand. So let us discuss about like, you know, some sort of post-traumatic disorder, PTSD. And do you think that, you know, this uh, disease can be prevented? And uh, what do you think that sort of changes in physical and emotional reactions can be? And do you think also, like, you know, maybe do patients, they can have some sort of suicidal thoughts and kind of traumatic events, you know, if they suffered with and they, they just think like, you know, we're lost and uh, we really want to, you know, attempt a sort of uh, suicide. And how do you see it, if you'd like to elaborate on that? Well, post-traumatic stress disorder used to be something that um, that was primarily diagnosed in veterans coming home from wars, you know, who saw the trauma of war. Um, but now we realize that uh, people can get PTSD, not necessarily, you know, they don't have to have been at the front lines in war, but they can have traumas, any kind of trauma in which their life was threatened or they're the, they say the integrity of your body, you know, injury where you expected to either be killed or injured. Um, and that could be from a car accident or from, um, uh, so it, it can also be from witnessing somebody uh, being where their life was in danger or they were in danger of either uh, getting killed or injured. Um, another interesting uh, fact about it is that when um, people they discovered that people who watched for many, many times over, many hours, people who watched the uh, Twin Towers in New York being hit on 9-11 by the airplanes, um, that they could get PTSD from witnessing that just by watching it on television, I mean, not just once or twice, you know, but pe some people get really um, glued to the television set watching that over and over and over again. And you can get a form of PTSD from that because in a sense, you feel endangered when you watch that or when you watch someone, you know, uh, just another person being in a, in a dangerous situation. And the symptoms um, have to do with, uh, first of all, um, feeling having in, intrusive thoughts of um the trauma uh having thinking about it all the not being able to control your thoughts the fact that you think about it all the time over and over again and um uh it can also come from people can get ptsd from um abuse you know children can get it from yeah. uh being physically or sexually abused and um uh, and have it, you know, it may not show until they get to be older. Um, and so you have these intrusive thoughts and intrusive feelings, and these things can be triggered by, uh, when you come across something that reminds you of the traumatic event. Mm -hmm. So let's say you were sexually abused by an uncle and, um, you see that uncle again a year later you know, that would bring back all those memories. Actually, people with PTSD try to avoid uh, things connected with the trauma. You know, like, for example, if it was a car accident uh, at a certain street, then they would go around, you know, um, and travel, ar drive around that area, not go near, you know, try to stay as far away from that street, that particular spot as possible. Um, and also it affects... Uh, 
feelings about it can make them feel in general like the world is a dangerous place um it can make people get numb they're afraid to sort of get close to other people they're afraid to experience feelings because they feel all the time that they have to be protective of themselves that they don't have whatever another trauma mm -hmm. All right. Okay. So, what is this sort of autism? And, and mostly, I've just heard about like you know, children. They mostly you know suffered with that. What do you think that could be a sign of autism in adults, especially as well? So, how do you see it? Like you know, in children and uh, in adults, is it something different? You know, a sort of uh, you can say symptoms or signs, or no, they're the same. But like you know, with these sort of signs and symptoms, they grow also and they adapt those sort of you know signs and symptoms and you can say traits, uh, you know, further in their life as well when they become older. So, how do you see? Uh, this would be the last question. Uh, of today's session and then we'll just you know try to uh, you know wrap it up okay um children with autism first of all autism for, for, seems to be increasing at least in america uh i and i think uh throughout the world um and people really aren't sure why that is you know whether it's a some i mean there are all kinds of theories like um vaccines certain vaccines are having too many vaccines together at one time as a child um or you know environmental toxins there there are various um you know theories about what causes it but it's usually uh diagnosed when a child in in at a very young age like uh like by 3 for example um and the symptoms are that the person doesn't interact um, fully with the parent. Those are some of the first symptoms that they see that um, the child doesn't follow them, like doesn't, doesn't keep looking at them when they're talking, um, uh, may do, may, doesn't play in a normal kind of way, so-called normal kind of way, um, uh, is very awkward around other kids. Um, and so, you know, but the, the real problem is that parents, some parents ignore these signs of um, their child being different and, um, and they don't bring them for treatment soon enough. So my advice about that is, and yes, then of course, you know, they, they, it is hard. Um, there is treatment. The treatment is primarily behavioral, meaning like um, the, there are hospitals where, that specialize in this or hospitals that have wards that where they specialize in this and they have behavioral treatment. So like um, the child is rewarded for doing behaviors that are, you know, within societal norms. And if they do something like if they may have a tantrum, that kind of thing, um, they're not, they're not, well, I mean, they're punished in a way, but not, and they're not physically punished, you know, they're not hit. Well, they're not supposed to be in any case. Um, but so it's more like uh, re giving rewards for positive behavior and, and shaping their behavior um, till it becomes more within uh, normal societal bounds. Um, the problem, it is a problem when, I mean, that's why, I was, as I was trying to say, that it's so important that parents bring children to the, their doctors um, mm -hmm. if they suspect something, mm -hmm. even if, they, of course, they're not going to necessarily know what they're looking at, but if you suspect something that isn't quite right, the sooner you bring the child to a doctor, the a pediatrician, the better. Now, um, Sometimes some doctors uh, will just say, oh, it's a phase. They're just going through a phase. Mm -hmm. And, um, and you know, you need to get a second opinion if a doctor says that, because, you know, you need to go to a doctor who's more specialized in these, a, a psychiatrist, really, a child psychiatrist. Um, and, and it's important to ch get children, autistic children into treatment early because, um, their behaviors, as I was describing, can be shaped better um, the younger they are, because it's it gets harder when children are grow up. I mean, I've been involved. I was involved in a case as an expert witness in a case uh, in Michigan where a little girl um, 
was autistic and her mother did recognize there was a problem very early on. She was two or three and um, she had gotten a bunch of vaccines. And that's when it was after that, that she noticed that her daughter was having these odd behaviors and so on. And um, she got help for her right away. All kinds of, she took it to all kinds of specialists and were, you know, getting lots of uh, help. And uh, of course, unfortunately, and, and I'm sure that did help, um, but, uh, as the child got older, uh, you know, in other words, she, the child grew up and was better than she would have been had she not gotten all this treatment, obviously, but, um, the child would sometimes hit her mother, you know, mm -hmm. out of frustration. The child was frustrated with not being able to express herself and so on. And she would sometimes hit her mother. And as the child got older, this was mm -hmm. one thing when the child was just uh, three or four or five, you mm -hmm. know, the mother could control her. But when the child got to be 13 and she was big, she was bigger than the mother, um, that became a real problem because she would punch her in the head and the mother would, you know, become unconscious. And she sometimes punched her when the mother was driving. She was in the car and she, she'd punch her mother while the mother was driving. Anyway, it got to be really, really um, very very dangerous. And, um, and so, uh, and the mother, you know, again, kept taking her to all kinds of doctors, but it just kept getting worse, uh, because she just because she was bigger. And, um, finally, uh, the mother sent her to a hospital where they treated people with autism and mm -hmm. the little girl did get better. Mm -hmm. And, um, but, uh, and she was hoping that <laughs> she was hoping that the girl would be um, would be taken into back into school, into a special class in school. But then the school said that they wouldn't take her. You may have heard about this case. It was a famous case. Um, so the mother, after 13 years, the mother just gave up. You know, she, they, she you know, this was what she, she was working towards and hoping for. Finally, she could get her back into a, a school and so on. So which year and, case um, was that? Sorry to interrupt. Which year case was that? Um, because... it, it was, it was, um, it, oh, one second. Let me look this up here. <laughs> um, uh, maybe it'll come to me, but let me, let no me problem. We'll, we'll, yeah. Um, you can send me the link then. Yeah. I'll just have Oh, it. okay. All right. Good. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've done so many, I've been doing it, being an expert witness for over 20 years. So I have so many cases. Oh, wow. This one was really one of the famous ones that I've done because, yeah. um, because of what I'm going to tell you. So the mother, the mother, she the mother was fairly religious mm -hmm. and um, uh, she was a Christian and she, you know, believed in God and so on. And she believed um, at the end that she and her daughter would be better off in heaven. Oh. So she um, took the daughter out into the woods, you know, they had a van and she set off a, um, a little stove, stoves that you use when you go on camping trips. Mm -hmm. And she had put one of those in the front where the daughter was and one of them in the back where she was. And she was going to go kill both of them at the same time. Oh. And fortunately, um, some one of her friends who she had been uh, texting with um, realized that there was something wrong and sent her husband out to look for her. And they found them before either of them died. Um, and, and so, so the mother, the way I got involved with it is that the mother, um, uh, was charged with, um, with murder, oh, yeah. uh, with attempted murder, I should say. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so I got involved because I, they hired me to be her expert witness mm -hmm. and I, um, I went to Michigan and I, you know, sp I spent two days examining the mother and having her tell me the whole long story. And the mother had PTSD. I talked about how um, it, the mother was living in a war zone in her house uh, oh. because the girl kept, you know, uh, abusing patient. her. Now, like, you know, herself, she was another patient. Like, you know, right. she, yeah. Yes. So I described it as she had PTSD and when the mother, you know, decided on this ultimate solution, she had nowhere else to turn. Um, that was part of her PTSD. That was part of her seeing the world in a certain way. And, um, and uh, she, of course she was also depressed. Um, and so, so 
you know, I explained the whole, the whole, her whole psychological condition and to say that she should be not guilty by reason of insanity. Mm -hmm. The problem was, um, and, and this program, I, and the, um, the, we, we got on Dr. Phil, do you know, the Dr. Phil show, um, Dr. Phil came out and interviewed her as well after the whole thing was over. And, uh, because it was such an interesting case yeah. and the problem was, that they didn't really have enough money, the family, the mother and her husband, who was a, a principal of a school, of a high oh. school, mm -hmm. um, but they didn't have enough money to pay these lawyers to continue mm -hmm. fighting the case. Mm -hmm. And so the lawyers, it was, this is really the saddest part of all, because the girl is okay, the 13 or now, this was, um, I don't know, about four or five years ago, this case. Um, and the mother, so the girl, the girl was okay. Um, the autistic girl was okay. Um, and, but because the lawyer, because the family didn't have enough money to pay the lawyers to keep fighting the case, the lawyers convinced the mother who was feeling so guilty anyway. So it was easy to convince her to do a plea bargain, to mm -hmm. not go to trial. And um, it just, you know, to admit that she did it and to to accept, a, um, she she wound up getting uh, 10 years in prison. Mm -hmm. And I it was very frustrating for me and the judge actually at the end. So I went to Minis uh, Michigan again, of course, to testify. And the judge said that uh, to testify at a at a um, at a hearing, but not at a trial. You know, it was just the judge uh, giving a sentencing Um and the judge said in court that if they had taken it to trial, that the lawyers should have taken it to trial, because with my testimony, certainly there would have been at least one person on the jury who would have voted to not, uh, you know, uh, convict her to to find to not find her guilty. So mm -hmm. anyhow, but so she took her ten years, and or she's taking her ten years. And that's that story. But, you know, the, the the moral of the story is, the moral of the story is you should always go to trial. Don't take a plea deal. <laughs> <laughs> or, okay. or, get, or find lawyers who yeah. are sympathetic enough that they won't ask you for a ton of money. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, but yeah. the moral of the story also yeah. is, there are because there's an increase in people with autism, there's going to be an increase of this kind of problem that as yeah. the children get older, it is harder to contain them. And of course, families, you know, don't want to um, put their children in a psychiatric hospital for the rest of their lives. Yes. That's a very, so um, about it. it's a very sad decision to make. Yes. Mm. Oh, quite sad story, I must say. Uh, thanks a lot. I would just, you know, by saying this, that uh, Carol uh, was an amazing session, you know, holding with you today. And definitely, I'm going to get back to you to discuss about, you know, more sessions. And uh, I think that I'm looking forward and invite you again on my channel. And uh, I would say thanks a lot for taking our time today. You're very welcome. It was my pleasure.